Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to October's A3D3 seminar. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our speaker today, who is uh, Dr. Julieta Grisco. Um, Julieta is um, an assistant professor at UNC Chapel Hill, um, but she got her BS in physics and BA in mathematics from the University of Rochester and her PhD um, from the University of Washington. And she had two years as a Papalado Fellow at, at MIT before joining UNC in January 2020. Um, so Juliet is going to be talking to us today about machine learning for germanium-based neutrinoless double beta decay searches, which sounds very interesting. Julieta. Okay. Thank you uh, for the introduction and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be talking with all of you today. I would say I'm talking to you from the perspective of someone who is not a machine learning expert, uh, like many of you are, but someone who's maybe a machine learning user, uh, thinking about how we can use some of these new techniques uh, for some new applications. Um, and so that's what I'm going to focus on is what some of the challenges are of using these techniques for our experiments and what some of the really interesting applications are. Um, and, and some of the challenges that it raises and how that makes us think about new techniques. Um, so I'm gonna give you an overview of uh, searches for neutrinoless double beta decay and how we use germanium-based experiments to look for them. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you about a few examples of some of the tools that we're working on. Um, one in the world of simulations of how we can improve our pole shape simulations. Um, and another um, uh, few examples on the analysis side. Um, of using, uh, every, you know, moving up in complexity from uh, uh, simple BDT, but really adding a lot of interpretability to it, um, to a data cleaning example. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the things that, that Obo, who's logged on to here, developed, uh, which is called the baseline model, um, and how we're, we're making it more interpretable and more explainable. Um, so first, I'll just tell you a little bit about what we're looking for, which is neutrinoless double beta decay. Um, so hopefully some of you are familiar with the concept of beta decay. Um, this is how the neutrino was discovered. Um, what happens is you have a neutron that turns into a proton plus electron and emits an antineutrino. Right, so that, that's a, a fairly fundamental nuclear decay here on the left. Um, and on the right, what you see is uh, double beta decay. In this case, two neutrino double beta decay. So you have two neutrons that turn into two protons, emitting two electrons, emitting two antineutrinos. Um, and this is a standard model process um, that has a very long half-life, um, but it is something within the standard model that occurs in a certain uh, subset of isotopes, uh, of nuclear isotopes. What we look for is the neutrinoless version of that uh, double beta decay, um, where instead of emitting two antineutrinos, you would exchange a virtual neutrino between those two nucleons, um, or you can think of it as the two antineutrinos annihilating with one another. Um, this would be new physics. Um, it can only happen if the neutrino is its own antiparticle. Um, and what we call that is the neutrino being a Majorana particle. Um, in that case, you would get two protons and two electrons out here, but no neutrinos. Um, and what that would mean is that we have made more matter than antimatter. We've made an excess uh, fr from two baryons. We've made two baryons and two leptons without any corresponding antileptons. Um, and so this would be brand new physics, um, and it would be a very exciting discovery. And that's what we're going to be looking for. Um, so here's the one sheet on why I look for this. Uh, so if we were to discover neutrinoless double beta decay, that would really dramatically uh, revise our understanding of cosmos of the cosmos. It would show you the lepton number is not conserved. It'd be a direct observation um, that this is not a conservation law. And it would tell you that the neutrino is a fundamental Majorana particle, the only one. Um, it would also give us a potential path for understanding why there is matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Um, we don't know what made the excess of matter over antimatter, and we would like to know. Um, and this would give us uh, a portal called leptogenesis um, as a mechanism for generating that asymmetry. Um, and then finally, it would be a, a demonstration that there's a new mechanism for the generation of mass. So the other particles, uh, that we know get their masses from the Higgs mechanism through interaction with the Higgs. Um, this would be a brand new way to get mass into a particle, which would be the Majorana mechanism. Uh, so all of these things combine to make the search for neutrinoless double beta decay incredibly compelling. Um, it's one of the most exciting things I think going on in the world of particle physics and nuclear physics right now. Um, 
there's a long history of ways to look for this decay. Um, and a lot of those experiments used germanium-76 as their source isotope. Um, so what you're seeing here in the plot is just a history of the half-life limits as a function of year. Um, so going upwards in this plot means you're searching for this process with more and more sensitivity. Um, and you can see that over the last approximately 50 years, um, a series of experiments have pushed our sensitivity to this process up by many, many orders of magnitude. We've gone from about 10 to the 21 up to 10 to the 26 years uh, over those years. Um, the two experiments here that you see at the end, Gerda and Majorana, are the two predecessor experiments uh, for what I'm going to tell you about today. Majorana is one of the ones I worked on. Um, and then I'll also tell you about Legend 200, which is now operating, and Legend 1000, uh, which we're designing and hoping to build in the coming years. Um, and what you're seeing on the right hand here is just you know, what, what those goals are, we would like to get to 10 to the 27 and then 10 to the 28 year half-life sensitivity. So incredibly long half-lives, incredibly rare processes that we're searching for. Um, okay, so if we're gonna search for a really rare signal, we should talk about what that signal looks like. Um, and here's uh, Feynman diagrams for that same two neutrino double beta decay and neutrino list double beta decay process. Uh, in our detectors, we actually don't measure neutrinos at all. The neutrinos have really low cross sections. Uh, so most of the time they just escape. What we measure instead um, are the charged particle energies. Um, so in this case, you know, you get a little tiny amount of energy from the recoiling nucleus. Most of your energy is going in these electrons, right? And the neutrinos escape as missing energy. And so for the two neutrino standard model process, you get this broad spectrum of energies um, resulting because you can produce a two neutrino double beta decay with uh, neutrinos almost at rest and end up on this side of the curve or with neutrinos with very high kinetic energy and end up on the low side of the curve. Most of the time you're somewhere in the middle and uh, the phase space and uh, uh, Fermi's golden rule give you this uh, spectral shape um, for that two neutrino double beta decay. Now, if the neutrino is Majorana, if it's own, its own antiparticle, and only then, you could have the neutrinoless double beta decay process occur. In this case, there's no missing energy, right? The neutrino is exchanged between the vertices. It's not in the final state. Um, so we recover the full energy of the decay, uh, which is what we call the Q value. And the signal that you see is this little red dot right at the end. Um, and you would get a delta function. All of your events would have the same energy right at that end point. Um, and they all stack up one on top of each other. And the width here is just determined by the energy rec resolution um, of your experiment. And what I've drawn here is germanium detector energy resolution. Um, the ratio you're seeing here between the blue curve and the red is already one order of magnitude worse than the limits we've been able to set to date. So we really are looking for a very tiny signal. Um, the other piece of information we're going to use to try to identify this signal is the event topology. So in germanium, uh, we're dealing with a solid and these electrons have about one MeV, one to two MeVs of energy. Um, that means that they don't travel very far in our detectors. They travel of order kind of millimeters, right? And that means that our double beta decay, these are single site events. Um, the betas uh, deposit all their energies within a very short uh, radius. Um, and we're gonna use that information to tell apart signal from background. Um, I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions, uh, since this is some basic kind of laying out of uh, what our what our uh, experiments are looking for. No? Okay, maybe a lot of you have seen double beta decay before. All right, All right I'll keep going. So uh, that's our spectral shape that we're going to measure. Um, let's talk a little bit about the sensitivity considerations for these experiments. So if you want to discover neutrinoless double beta decay, uh, we're going to be going to incredibly long half-life sensitivities. So um, the minimum you need for discovery in the presence of any sort of background is something like three or four counts for a three sigma discovery, right? So that means we can immediately translate that to a scale um, in terms of size and in uh, duration of exposure for our experiments. Um, so if you wanna hit a 10 to the 26 year half-life with three to four counts, um, you need to have 100 kilogram years of experiment, right? For 10 to the 27 years, you're gonna need a one ton year exposure. For 10 to the 28 years, you're gonna need a 10 ton year exposure, right? So 
this already tells you sort of the scale of the experiments that we're working with. Um, we're going to be talking about kind of hundreds of kilograms to a ton of experimental material that we're instrumenting. Um, now, if you want to get good statistical significance for those three counts, uh, you need to have very good signal to background ratio. And what that means is that you need to have very low background event rates and the best possible energy resolution. Um, so on the right, uh, what you see is a plot of what a discovery would look like in legend. So this is um, an example spectrum for the next generation experiment, legend 1000. Um, if you had neutrinoless double beta decay occurring with a half-life of 10 to the 28 years, and if we hit our background goal for the experiment. Um, so what you're seeing in this zoomed in spectrum is the tail of the two neutrino double beta decay uh, energy spectrum on the left, those are the blue uh, events. Then you're seeing just a flat random background um, from a combination of background sources in the experiment. Um, and then you're seeing these red events, which are a peak at Q beta beta, and that's our signal that we'd be looking for. So we know the energy of the signal we're trying to collect, um, and we're simply looking for a peak uh, in that energy window that has these right sort of uh, topological features. Right, of being a single site event contained in one detector. Um, so this also shows you a little bit of why uh, germanium is such a compelling way to do these experiments. Um, we think we can hit this background goal. Um, and you can see that because of the good energy resolution, um, your two new beta beta still stays well away from your signal region. Um, and you don't have any background peaks in the region of interest. Um, so there's nothing overlapping the signal that could fool you. Um, so, uh, at every sort of generational stage, these germanium experiments try to design for what we call unambiguous discovery. Our goal is to have uh, backgrounds much less than one count um, after the full operation of the experiment. Um, so we're always going to be looking, uh, you know, when we when we talk about making discoveries at the limits of our sensitivity, we're looking to make discoveries with three to four counts. Um, and so the pedigree of each of those three or four counts matters, um, you know, is incredibly important. Um, and that's going to determine our analysis strategies is the fact that we're relying on such a small signal to make a discovery. Um, so just a word more about backgrounds and why they're so important. Um, what you're seeing here is a plot of how your sensitivity uh, to make a discovery on the y-axis uh, rises with exposure in the presence of differing levels of backgrounds. The blue band here is sort of uh, reaching the top of that blue band is like our sensitivity goal for these next generation experiments. Um, so the solid line is uh, linear growth in sensitivity. So you have a log log scale, so it still looks linear. Um, and this is what happens if you have zero backgrounds in an experiment. Um, so think about, you know, LIGO's first detection, right? LIGO's first detection had an incredibly high signal to noise. They were basically background free. And one event was enough to make a discovery, right? Um, this dashed line that you're seeing at the bottom is what happens when you're background limited. So when you're background limited, your sensitivity grows as the square root of your exposure. Um, and you can see that if you want to cross that blue band, uh, it, it's pretty much impossible. We're, we're needing uh, exposures of a thousand ton years, uh, which just is not uh, realistic for our types of experiments. Um, so we try to get as close as we can to this linear growth, to this background free region. And our goal is that red dash line. Um, and that's what we call quasi background free operation. What that means is just that over the full life uh, of the experiment, the full exposure, we have less than one background count expected uh, within the region of interest. Um, and that's the goal that Legend is trying to hit. Okay, so in terms of how these experiments actually work, if we wanna build an experiment where we can see one atom decay, uh, we need very high efficiency and we need very low rates of other kinds of events. Um, so all of the experiments, uh, nearly all the double beta decay experiments follow the same strategy, uh, which is we go deep underground to get away from cosmic rays or inside a clean room to keep uranium and thorium and radon away from our detectors. Um, we build a shield and then we build an experiment um, at the center of that shield where the source and the detector are the same thing. Um, and that gives you that high efficiency and helps you reduce the backgrounds. Um, and then you wait for your detector to decay um, and you measure those signals and that's where your uh, potential discovery will come from. Um, we also want to use other this other topological information um, to, to know what's signal and what's background. So in our double beta decay, these two betas go off 
uh, with a one to two millimeter distance within a solid state detector, like a germanium detector. Um, and our, a lot of our backgrounds are coming from gammas. Um, and at these energy ranges, um, gammas tend to scatter. They, they, their most probable interaction is a Compton scatter. Um, and those scatters can be separated by several centimeters um, of distance. And so uh, you can tell the difference here by having a single site versus a multi-site event reduction. Of course, something dangerous can happen, which is your gamma can scatter in your detector and then scatter in some material that's not your detector. Um, and here uh, you could end up with something that looks like a double beta decay event, right? We'll get back to that in a moment. The other type of backgrounds that we worry about are our backgrounds from alphas and betas. These tend to be mostly surface events um, in our detectors. The, the, the bulk of the detector material is incredibly pure, um, but alphas can penetrate some of the surfaces. They, they only go in about 10 microns. Betas can go in one to two millimeters um, and can penetrate most of the surfaces. So if we can use the event location, you know, tell whether an event occurred on the surface or in the bulk of the detector, um, or tell whether it had multiple sites or one site, uh, we can use that information to reduce the backgrounds. The other way we can use backgrounds is by making more materials active. So if we return to this gamma that's scattered in the detector and then in some surrounding material, if that surrounding material now suddenly is instrumented in some way, say it's a scintillator, um, then you would see that event. And you would then once again see that this isn't double beta decay, it's a two site event. Right? So if we make more active materials, we have less missing information um, and we can recover uh, that, that background rejection performance. So these are the strategies that our experiments use um, to go after these very rare decays. Right? So uh, the experiments I'm telling you about are part of a long lineage of experiments looking for neutrinoless double beta decay in germanium. Um, so I'm going to tell you about one project that we published based on the Majorana demonstrator, uh, which has now completed its search for double beta decay. Um, this experiment combined with another experiment called Gerda, which is also complete, and we formed Legend 200, which is now taking data and has released actually its first results. Um, and at the same time, we're working on design uh, for Legend 1000, uh, which is the next generation experiment. Um, so a little bit more about Legend. Legend 200 is a 200 kilogram experiment running at Gran Sasso National Lab in Italy. Um, we have an energy resolution goal of two and a half keV full at half max and a background goal of two times 10 to the minus four. Um, and we've released our first results, but actually I'm not gonna talk much about those uh, since I'm talking about the ML program within Legend. Um, Legend 1000 is gonna be a thousand kilogram experiment um, staged via payloads that can be deployed over time. This will be about 340 detectors. Um, this is a new cryostat, new clean room at LNGS um, that we're, we're starting some infrastructure work on now. Um, and the background goal has another factor of 20 reduction uh, beyond our current experiment. Um, so, you know, we're waiting on funding for this and for the review process to play out, uh, but we've already gotten started, especially on the analysis and simulations development for it. Okay. Both of these experiments use uh, germanium detectors. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how these detectors work. So. Uh, like I said, the source and the detector are the same thing here. Um, we enrich uh, germanium so that it is over 90% germanium-76, and then we grow a single crystal diode out of it. Um, so this is a semiconductor detector, um, which means you have a small band gap, and that means you have a lot of you know, millions of electron hole pairs uh, for our signal, and that gives you very excellent energy resolution. Um, and the integrated current of the signal that you see as these charges drift through the detector, it's going to be proportional to the energy deposited in the detector. Um, one detail here, and oh, on the right here, what you're seeing is a picture of a detector with a person's hands and some calipers for scale, so you can see sort of what we're talking about here. These detectors are about three kilograms each. Um, and yes, that's a, a single crystal diode that is about three kilograms. Um, there's some details here, which is uh, we've made a detector design um, very specifically to help us reduce the backgrounds. Um, and in this design, uh, which is called a point contact style design, the pulse shape that you get for an event is highly dependent on the position. Um, so here's a couple of examples of that. So on the left, what you're seeing is a neutrinoless double beta decay candidate where you have a single site event, right? The event occurs somewhere inside the crystal, the charges, the holes and the electrons begin to drift in the electric field. Um, and what you see is the induced uh, voltage at the readout um, here at the point contact. So that's what's being drawn on the left. 
uh, sorry, on the right here. So the blue curve is our induced voltage and the orange curve is the current at that point in time. Um, and you see that because uh, the charges are all drifting together, they all started at the same point, um, you see sort of a single rise in the signal and a single peak in the current. On the right, what you see is a gamma background event where you have scatters in multiple locations. Right? So here we have charges, the same amount of energy is being deposited, but our charges are split between two different sites. Um, and because the beginning of this charge drift um, is slow and the charges have very different lengths that they need to drift, we see that those charges arrive at the point contact at different times. And that creates this double pulse structure um, and two peaks in our current. Um, and so a lot of our background rejection techniques rely on analyzing the waveform shape to tell apart signal from background using um, those kinds of traits. Um, similarly, the design of the detector also gives us um, sensitivity to surface events uh, versus bulk events. So the top two are those uh, neutrinoless double beta decay and gamma background events like before. Um, but on the bottom here, you're seeing uh, what it looks like when you have a signal start on the outer thick contact of the detector. There you have very slow charge movement as the charges diffuse through a low field region. And that creates this very slow rise in the waveform and a really suppressed current. Um, and on the point contact of the detector, um, there, when the charges drift, they don't have any time to separate via diffusion and self-repulsion. So your charge all arrives very quickly right at the same time, and that gives you a very high spike in the current. Um, so in the traditional analysis, we use pretty much entirely a single parameter, which is the amplitude of the peak current signal uh, to tell apart multi-site, single-site, surface, and bulk events. Um, and that gives us this really efficient neutrinoless double beta decay event selection. Um, so this is the technique that uh, we're competing against when we're developing ML techniques. Um, so these germanium detectors have undergone a lot of innovation over the last few years. Um, a semi-coax detector, if you've ever done anything with a germanium detector, this is probably the type of detector you've used. These are large mass, but they don't have this very sophisticated uh, pulse shape variation uh, uh, feature. And so they're not very good for background rejection. Uh, then we went to these small point contact style detectors. And now for Legend, we've developed new larger point contact detectors. Um, so these have excellent background rejection with traditional methods and larger masses. Um, and this is where most of our attention is focused. Okay, so in Legend, uh, these detectors are deployed in an active shield made out of liquid argon. Um, so this is a noble liquid, so it scintillates when you deposit energy in it. Um, and we've instrumented it with wavelength shifting fibers and silicon photomultipliers to read out the light. Um, and so if you see any light deposit in liquid argon, that tells you this was a multi-site event, this wasn't double beta decay, and you can reject it. Um, so that, that's the important part for what we're talking about, so I'm not going to talk about the other features on this slide. Um, one more thing you should know about uh, is our calibration technique. So uh, once a week, we deploy thorium sources inside the uh, liquid argon volume, um, and that's used for energy scale and pulse shape parameter calibration. Um, so uh, what you're seeing at the top here is the thorium energy spectrum, um, and the spectrum has a mix of single site and multi-site events. Um, so from this high energy uh, 2615 keV peak, um, you have a mix uh, inside that peak of single site and multi-site events. But that peak also creates uh, a single escape peak where you've done pair production um, and one of the gammas escaped. That is a known multi-site population. And you've created a double escape peak where both the gammas from the pair production escape. And that is a known single site event population. Um, so we use those two peaks to calibrate um, and test our pulse shape rejection techniques. You also have a bismuth uh, full energy peak, which again, mix of multi-site and single site, and you've got some other features. So um, in between, for example, the Compton shoulder and the high energy peak, you know that you have multiple Compton scattering. So this is a highly multi-site uh, population and you can use some other features like this. Um, so what you're seeing on the bottom here is the classifier, that traditional data classifier we use based on the current height. Um, and you can see the difference uh, between known single site population here, the dark blue uh, is the double escape peak. Um, and then the single escape peak, our known multi-site population is the light blue. And you can see that um, you can tell it apart based on this parameter. 
Um, the orange here are known alpha events uh, on that point contact. They create very high uh, current values, and they're all sitting to the right of our acceptance region. Um, so this is the data that we're going to be able to use if we want to tune these parameters. OK, so here's a summary of what we've learned when it comes to doing AIML with these experiments. These are granular detectors with very low backgrounds. That means that our physics event rate is incredibly low in the experiment, less than one hertz per detector. Um, and that also means that noise-induced events and crosstalk and things like that can make up a really large fraction of the triggered waveforms that we see. Um, so this is not this is fairly different than doing analysis in a lot of astrophysics or high energy physics settings um, where your analysis has to run really fast. Uh, we have low rates, so we can do time intensive analysis of our final waveforms. Um, the algorithms do have to be able to run on these sort of tens of million calibration, uh, tens of million event calibration data sets um, to actually measure signal acceptance and, and stability. Uh, but we can do time intensive analyses. We're not uh, sort of rate limited. Um, the other thing that we have to deal with as a result is that um, when we do design studies, we have to do really high statistic simulations to study rare backgrounds um, because the backgrounds we're worried about are really the one in a million backgrounds um, at this point. Um, so that also sets some requirements on the types of uh, analysis techniques we can use and simulation techniques we can use. Another feature here is that those traditional pulse shape parameters really do perform quite well for background rejection. Um, so if we are going to build new techniques, we want to do them, to build those techniques in a way that improves on those existing knowledge and the existing pulse rate parameters. We have very good physics knowledge of how signals are formed. We want to make that an input into what we build. Um, and then finally, because we're competing against a traditional analysis that works very well, um, we're often going to be thinking about taking on tasks other than just signal background event classification. It's very hard to compete with something that's almost already working you know, nearly optimally. Um, so let's think about other things we can do with machine learning. Um, and then finally, just going back to that idea that um, our discovery here would be claimed based on as few as three events. So having an interpretable analysis here um, and a quantifiable analysis is really key and that's gonna guide our development. Um, so I shamelessly stole this slide from Ovo uh, because I do think it captures a lot uh, in one, one look here. Um, and I think a few other people at this talk are, are working on similar, on, on different pieces of this. But um, over the last few years, a, a huge effort on germanium machine learning has blossomed. Um, and there's all sorts of projects in different aspects of the analysis. Um, the ones that I boxed here are just ones that my group has been involved in. Um, and I'm not going to tell you about all of them because I just don't have time. Um, but what I am going to do is try to give you a, a smattering of uh, kind of a, a, a little bit of like a smorgasbord of what we're working on uh, in some of these different applications. OK, so first we're going to talk about a simulation project, um, which is doing pulse shape uh, modeling uh, using machine learning. Um, so we have very good first principles physics knowledge of how signals form in our detectors. Um, but these are not really being used regularly. And the, the main reason for that is, is that it's actually even harder than it is uh, to to model the physics in the detectors, it's even harder to model the electronics in this experiment. Um, our detectors are deployed in liquid argon with a huge cable length in between. Um, all of the cables are packed together. Uh, you don't necessarily know all of the capacitances and all of the inductances that figure in to getting the electronic, the, the signal from the germanium detector and into your digitizer. Um, now, in the past, we had tried a sort of Bayesian fitting approach uh, for the Majorana demonstrator. Um, and what we saw was that just modeling the electronics required 12 different free parameters, and those parameters were highly degenerate with one another. Um, and so you had to do a fit, fitting out all the detector parameters and all the electronics parameters simultaneously. Um, but of course, the electronics are a little bit unstable. Um, so this changes over time, and you had to keep repeating these fits. And they really didn't like to converge very well uh, because of all of those degeneracies. Um, so we had the idea that maybe emulating the electronics um, would allow for more accurate background modeling and potentially even for fitting out things like the positions of events in our detectors. Um, and then on the flip side, we would really love to be able to deconvolve the electronics response from our data waveforms um, to improve how the pulse shape discrimination performance works, um, to improve all of these analysis steps. 
Um, so what we want to do is try to connect our very good physics first principles waveform simulations with the data and design a network that can close the gap between our simulations and our data by correctly modeling this missing step of the electronics. Um, so we started thinking about how to design a network to do that. Really the tough part here is the training. We have large ensembles of data waveforms. We have large ensembles of simulated waveforms, but we don't know in most cases, the one-to-one -one match between them, right? So, uh, and, and that match matters to me, right? I want the network to take a, a waveform and make it look like the equivalent waveform in data, not just any other waveform in data. I don't want to just make a member of the ensemble. I actually want to make a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, so here I've just shown you an example of that. So um, on the top, you've got a simulated single-site event. On the bottom, you've got a simulated multi-site event. If our network takes that multi-site event and makes it look like a single-site data event, I don't want that. That's not useful to me, right? I want my network to keep my multi-site event multi-site with the same, you know, the same position that it originally had. Um, and I want it to keep my single site event single site, right? So I wanna make sure I'm following these purple arrows and not the pink ones. Um, so uh, the breakthrough here came by deciding to use what's called a cycle GAN. Um, so many of you might have heard of GANs, but may not have heard of cycle GANs. So a GAN is a generative adversarial network um, where you have a generator and a discriminator being trained off of one another. Right? So as the generator improves in imitating uh, whatever population you're trying to model, the discriminator can still, as long as the discriminator can still tell them apart, the generator has to keep improving. Uh, once the discriminator starts to fail, you know, starts to fail, that then the discriminator has to start getting better. Right. So they train off of one another um, and and force each other to improve. Um, now, that GAN technique only does ensemble matching. Right. To get this one-to-one -one match matching, the cycle GAN adds an extra cycle, right? So we start from our uh, one of our populations, we model uh, using this first generator into the other population. And yes, you have to check whether that looks like a viable member of the population, but you also have to be able to translate back with a, new, a second generator and check that you've translated back to the correct event. So in this example here that I'm showing on the upper left, if I take this simulated waveform, make it look like data, and then go back to simulation, it has to come back to looking like itself. It can't come back to looking like this multi-site event um, because I have a loss term preventing that from uh, looking like something that's working uh, for my network. So you end up training two generators and two discriminators simultaneously, um, one for the forward direction and one for the backward direction. Um, so actually we solve both, you know, both directions of problems here, make simulations look like data and make data look like simulations. Okay, uh, now we actually need to choose what we're gonna use as our generator and discriminator for this technique. For the generator, we went with a 1D unit um, and we added a positional encoding um, that's inspired by transformers so that it sort of cares whether the waveform, uh, doesn't care whether the waveform is shifted within the window, right? Um, because a waveform slightly to the right or slightly to the left is actually the same waveform. Um, then for our discriminator, we're using an LSTM that has an attention mechanism built in. Um, so this is just a recurrent neural net with a score function on each of the nodes that allows it to put extra weighting on particular parts of the waveform, um, depending on the application you're doing. Um, and, and that's a, a those, those weights are another parameter of the model that gets toned. Um, this was originally designed as what we called our legend baseline model. So a model that does waveform analysis for lots of different purposes. Um, and so it's pretty well suited to be able to tell apart, you know, simulated from data waveforms. Um, we do have plans here with the generator. We'd love to put in a physics informed generator network in the future that actually has something more like a real electronics model in the back end. Um, but that's sort of uh, ways away still. Okay, so here's what uh, preliminary results look like from this. Um, and they're looking pretty good. So here's our simulated input waveforms, um, our output after simulation and emulation. And you can see that by eye, it looks pretty good uh, compared to our data target. Um, on the bottom, uh, what we have are a couple of the different pulse shape parameters we're using uh, to check how this is performing. Um, so one of them is, for example, the slope of this RC decay tail um, and the uncertainty in it as we start adding noise to the model. Um, so 
uh, this vertical line that you're seeing is our simulated data sample. Those don't have a decay, so all of their tails are flat. Um, and our data has this uh, distribution shape in blue. Um, and after we run it through the model, uh, our output waveforms have the right spread um, and right uh, slope of their tails. Um, on the left, the plot here is the current amplitude maximum. So that pulse shape discrimination parameter that we use in the traditional analysis. Um, and you can see that our simulate, simulated inputs, their, their pulses are, are rising too quickly because they don't have the bandwidth of the preamplifier applied that slows down those pulses. Um, and then after coming out from the model, uh, the shaded output here, um, you can see that it's shifting down the speed of the pulses um, and spreading it out to align it better with our data. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's looking a lot better. Um, what we decided to do next, so, so there is a workshop paper from uh, NeurIPS uh, Machine Learning in the Physical Sciences workshop uh, that you can see at the link there. Um, and we're also doing uh, a lot of validation studies at the moment. So right now we're using kind of a pure simulation-based study where you can do waveform by waveform comparison. Um, so we're applying an extra electronics effect and then seeing if our machine learning network can, can responsibly emulate it and, and correctly emulate it. Um, and so that's where we are at the moment. Uh, we're seeing something that I think I've been warned about, but uh, hadn't quite appreciated, which is that cycle GANs can be quite tricky to train. They have a lot of instabilities. And so when we changed you know, the structure of the incoming data um, in terms of, of putting in some existing electronics effects that we already knew about, uh, we've had to kind of retrain our hyperparameters to get that, C that cycle GAN working again. Um, so, you know, that is the downside of the cycle GAN. It's a fairly complex network structure. It takes a little bit of, of tweaking to get it working nicely. Um, our next step after that is going to be to do validation with a scanning system where we're actually using real location tag data from the detectors. Um, I'm excited to see how that's going to go. But uh, this is a technique that we're already uh, digging into here and seeing that it's producing some interesting results. Okay. Next, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some analysis. Um, I am. Do you guys like to end right at the hour? I think I might skip. No, the idea is if, you know, uh, maybe another 10 or 15 minutes and then it gives us time for questions. For you. Great. So I'm going to skip the BDT uh, because we have a published paper on it. Uh, so if you'd like to know more uh, about this interpretable BDT project, I encourage you to check out um, this link. Uh, since that one's published, I'm going to spend less time talking about it because you can go to the paper and ask me questions about it. I think BDTs are a, a fairly, you know, they're a very well-established technique, um, but we've done some things that I think are pretty cool on the interpretation side, um, and that's really what we focused on in the paper. Um, but instead of that, I'm going to talk about some new projects. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our semi-autonomous data cleaning. Um, this is a paper that should be coming out on the archive very soon. It's already submitted, but uh, being held up, I think, because of a flood of uh, large language model fake papers that they're trying to sort through. Um, <laughs> so uh, the motivation here is that traditional data cleaning is quite a painful process. Um, normally, you have to develop parameters for every new type of uh, noise or anomalous event that you see. Um, what we wanted to do was develop a method that adapts to changing run conditions, allows you to identify new populations during uh, detector commissioning, and is a flexible framework that you can use in lots of different detector experiment, you know, detectors and experiment setups. Um, so uh, what we decided to do was build a, what we call the semi-supervised network. Um, what we mean by that is that we're going to start by extracting pulse shape information from the waveforms. We're going to group and label similar waveforms with an unsupervised learning classification step. And then we're going to uh, have a human come in, do some interpretation on those unsupervised learning uh, steps, um, and you know label those waveforms based on our intelligence of what we want uh, as normal events or different types of anomalous events in our in our sample. Um, and then we're going to extend those classifier results with a supervised learning model uh, once we've got that human input. Um, and then finally, of course, we're going to analyze the results. Um, so our first step here is the information extraction. We start with our inf initial informations, uh, initial waveforms, um, but these are, are fairly long and they're highly sampled. You know, the, the sampling is, is very uh, fast sampling in our data acquisition. So there's a lot of information here. We don't need all of it. So what we do first is we do a wavelet decomposition, which is like a time-sensitive Fourier transform, um, and it downsamples the waveform, uh, and we choose a wavelet shape based on our signal shape. 
Um, and so for us, that's a Haar wavelet, which is like a step function. Um, and we're going to use these approximate coefficients here uh, as the waveforms that we're going to be running our, our machine learning on. Our next step is to use affinity propagation. So this is a type of clustering, uh, unsupervised learning clustering algorithm. Um, it's a little less common than something like dbSCAN. Um, but one of the things we liked about it is that it returns an exemplar from each cluster. So it automatically clusters your events, uh, computes the number of clusters based on the distribution of the data, and gives you sort of a prototypical member of each of those clusters as a representative. Um, and that's going to be really useful for our next step. So we train on 10,000 waveforms um, to obtain exemplars from those approximate coefficients. And we end up with about 100 clusters, um, each represented by an exemplar. This is the port where the human comes in. Um, the AP returns these clusters, and the user goes through and labels those uh, exemplars using the human-determined data cleaning categories. Um, so this is a chance for the user to figure out if something new is happening in the detector, for example. Right? So if your detector is, is going wrong somehow, you have some sort of new noise showing up, you would want to know about it. And this is how you would see it. The AP would help you pull that information out of your data stream um, and focus on it. Um, most of the time, there's not something new. We label these with our known categories. Um, and then our next step is to train a support vector machine based on these clustered events. Um, so the SVM learns to draw decision boundaries between these clusters. Um, and then when we have new data, we can just do the wavelet decomposition and feed them into the SVM and immediately generate a label for any new event that comes in. Um, so here's what the performance of this looks like. Um, you can see, uh, so surviving events, we really want to keep these nice step-like waveforms, and we want to remove all this crud uh, that's showing up at the right. And you can see that this is performing quite nicely at low energy and at high energy. Um, we did a test with uh, event salting, where we were able to show that the efficiency here is over 99.9%. It's actually performing a lot better than our traditional data cleaning, I would say. Um, and it's already in use for Legend 200 data faking. Uh, so in one of the software stacks, we have two software stacks for Legend. In one of them, it is the primary data cleaning method. In the other one, it's being used to validate our traditional data cleaning. Um, one of the nice things about this is that it can be uh, automatically adapted with almost no, uh, you know, doesn't require any rewriting uh, if you're running it on a new uh, detector system. So we've used this for characterization data. We've used it for data taken in our own laboratory. Um, and it just works out of the box for all of these applications. Um, so it really offloads this sort of painful process of data cleaning uh, to a machine for you. Um, one extension that we're working on now is adapting this to analyze the data from the liquid argon system. Um, so in Legend, we're using that liquid argon coincidence information to tag when a background event is occurring. Um, so uh, you're looking for silicon photomultiplier hits in coincidence with germanium hits. Um, and there's a real danger here from crosstalk between germanium and sipum channels, right? Because that also occurs in coincidence uh, by definition, right? And if you have a crosstalk event that you've accidentally missed labeling, um, and it has a non-zero integral or a non-zero uh, amplitude, um, you're going to count that as a photon in the liquid argon system when you shouldn't have. Um, and that's going to keep us from being able to lower our threshold for looking for tagging backgrounds. Um, and we, we think we understand where these are coming from. We have an ultra low background cable um, that doesn't have a lot of shielding between the, the SIPM readout and the germanium readout, and crosstalk is happening in that cable. And you can see here two examples. Uh, on the left, you've got a true coincidence with the germanium and the SIP impulses. Um, and you get two photoelectrons that are sort of occurring right in the time where you expect them to. Um, and then on the right, what you're seeing is a sample crosstalk event. So it's germanium in the SIPM. You've got this crosstalk blip with a different waveform shape. But uh, if you're just doing a time amplitude analysis, this would look like a signal. Uh, a coincidence signal. Um, and so this is quite dangerous. So we'd like to develop a better technique to tag the SIPM crosstalk. Um, here's why that's a little bit difficult. Um, the SIPM normally crosstalk depends on energy or amplitude. Uh, in this case, though, the SIPM crosstalk varies with the germanium waveform current. Um, and that means that the crosstalk looks different for single site and multi site events uh, in the germanium detector. So it's not a consistent signal shape. Um, 
So you can see an example here. These are two different alpha events. One has lower energy, but a faster rise, and it leads to larger crosstalk than the slower but larger event in the orange. Um, on the top here, we've got uh, crosstalk with single site germanium detector events. And on the bottom, you've got crosstalk with multi-site germanium detector events. So there's a lot of variety here. These And all of these plots are from the exact same SIPM, just creating very different signal shapes, depending on what's going on in the germanium detector. Um, so this makes crosstalk quite challenging to tag. Um, and we suspect here, we suspected that APSVM might actually be easier to implement and more accurate than our traditional tag. Um, so that's what we started working on. Um, so our first step was adapting the event pre-processing for SIPM signals. Um, so uh, the germanium signals are all centered at the same part of the waveform. Uh, for the AP's sake, we need to have the, the rising edge centered always at the same location. Um, so we had to window from the SIPM signals correctly uh, to, to be able to feed this to our network. Um, we've set this up so that multiple signals can be pulled from the same waveform trace um, because SIPMs can have multiple triggers within each uh, event window. Um, so we are ampli uh, amplitude normalizing these, but we're not applying any of that wavelet filtering. Um, and then we salted our training data with known crosstalk events um, just to give the AP something to work with. Uh, crosstalk is rare enough that uh, if you just pull 10,000 events, you might just not have any crosstalk in them. Uh, it won't be able to make the category that way. Um, and so here's some preliminary results. It's looking really exciting, I think. Um, the top row here are the exemplars and the bottom row are the waveforms that are, that are falling under that tag at the AP stage. Um, and we're separating quite cleanly out the noise triggers on the left from a bunch of different varieties of crosstalk here, um, each showing up in their own category on the right. Um, so we're really excited about this and it might solve one of these issues that we're dealing with with Legend. Um, I am 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna wrap it up pretty quickly. Uh, maybe I'll give a really quick pitch for this feature important supervision um, as the last thing that I'll tell you about. Um, so uh, this is something more on the side of, you know, using known physics information to do waveform analysis. Um, so we created something called the legend baseline model, um, where we had the goal of making an interpretable multipurpose model for waveform analysis, um, where you would use different parts of the waveform uh, for doing different tasks and knowing uh, what we do about our detectors, we know that different parts of the waveform are useful for different tasks. Um, and so our goal with uh, applying something called feature important supervision is to create a mechanism by which the user can add that physics knowledge to this baseline model. Um, so what that looks like in practice is additional loss functions that are telling the network what information should be useful in the task um, and encouraging the network to ignore irrelevant information. Um, so we built this off of this legend baseline model, uh, which is an RNN that we use to process the waveform data that has this attention mechanism that lets the network overweight certain regions uh, that are most relevant for the task. Um, so uh, these attention scores, we also use them as a method of interpretability. So for example, this is uh, using the LBM to uh, distinguish multi-site events. You can see that the attention zooms in on this little kink in the waveform, so that's good. Um, there's a danger here of the legend baseline model. Uh, we start off by normalizing all our events. And so the baseline is going to contain noise information um, and you can end up introducing an energy bias. Um, so feature important supervision uh, is a mechanism to counter it. Um, so what you do with feature important supervision is you're gonna add extra terms to the loss um, that force the network to look only at the relevant parts of your uh, data. Um, so in addition to our kind of original loss function shown here on the left, we're going to give it a subset of the data that contains just the important information. In this case, just the rising edge of the waveform, right? And we wanna ensure that the network will produce accurate output from just that feature. Similarly, or, or sort of the opposite, if I mask that relevant information and give it only irrelevant information, it should produce random output. If I add random irrelevant information to my relevant information, it shouldn't perform any better, right? And then we've actually added one more term here, uh, which is our human uh, interpretation of what features should be important. So this is um, on the um, uh, model attention. We would we think the model attention should look like this at the end. So we're, we're actually uh, adding an extra term here to sort of encourage the model attention to do uh, what we think is the right thing to do. Um, 
So we did a first test um, of this technique um, to do multi-site event rejection. And we also went ahead and tested whether it was creating bias uh, based on energy. Um, so we tested two different samples. Uh, one was single site uh, and multi-site events in the DEP and SEP to actually test the multi-site rejection. Um, but then we also just tested with two regions of the Compton continuum. These, in terms of their event topology, should look exactly the same, but they're different in energy. So if our network is distinguishing between these two different energy windows, we know we're developing an energy bias. Uh, so what we really want is the event, the network to not make any distinction, uh, to, to do random classification uh, for that Compton continuum sample. Um, so on the top here, you get the results of the actual multi-site event rejection. Um, adding the RNN with FIS, this red curve, uh, performs uh, as well, or a little, actually a little bit better than our traditional multi-site rejection. Um, and you can see that without the FIS, the RNN appears to perform really, really well, right? But then when you dig into this energy dependence, you see that that's because it's creating a huge energy bias. That's what we're seeing with this orange curve deviating from that random knowledge, right? Um, whereas by adding feature importance supervision, we're able to recover that flat uh, inability to distinguish based solely on energy. Um, so we're eliminating the bias. And when we look at the resulting spectra, we see something really similar. So the orange here is our original RNN, and you see, uh, sorry, the green here is the original legend baseline model, and you see this huge tilt in the spectrum, which is that energy bias coming into play. Now, uh, by adding the FIS, we go to the purple, we recover the correct shape for the spectral shape um, while still keeping really good performance on multi-site rejection. Um, okay, running out of time, so I'll just make one quick pitch here. Uh, we are always looking for new folks interested in joining this team. I don't think we have any undergrads present, uh, but we're always looking for new grad students. We're also currently hiring a postdoc, so if you're looking for a postdoc, get in touch. Um, and I'll leave you here with my conclusion slide and not take up any more time. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Juliet. That was, that was really good. Um, I, what surprises me is actually conceptually how much similarity there is between what you're doing and what we do with multi-messenger astronomy um, yeah. in terms of, you know, low rates, but, but also a lot of overlap. Anyhow, uh, I'll open the floor to any questions from anyone who's still on. Aldo. <laughs> yeah, very nice talk today. I'm very excited to see this uh, um, cross system, system cross talk uh, application of the APS VM model. So, uh, I, I'm wondering, did you show the all the exemplar that has been learned by the algorithm? Because I only saw yeah. one, basically. Yeah. So I don't have. I I can show it to you later. I'll send it to you if you want. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I don't have the full plot of all the exemplars. Um. Honestly, with the exemplars there, the SIPM data stream has a lot of noise in it. So we see a lot of different noise exemplars, but we are also seeing these crosstalk exemplars being pulled out um, nice. and our normal pulses. Um, so that this is kind of a nice technique actually, because our different SIPMs actually create different signal shapes. So we'll end up with different exemplars for different SIPMs showing up. Um, and that's actually totally fine within this APSVM framework. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Yeah, very nice result. Do you then use those exemplars to as as feedback to try and remove things in the data pipeline? Then this is a known artifact, and yeah. So this is how we're using it uh, in large part in Legend right now. So in the in the main data analysis, um, what's happening is the quality assurance and quality control of the data. Uh, they're using the APS VM as feedback, right? right. Of you know oh, our traditional data cleaning has missed this category or is yeah. over tagging in this category. Let's go back and fix the traditional analysis. Um, so I, you know, there's a tight connection between the traditional analysis and the, the machine learning one. Yeah. Well, that, that's really cool. Yeah, I like that. Um, Yanina? Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Um, I also wanted to ask on the data cleaning, are you, um, uh, so you said it's unsupervised, um, how often do you repeat the training? Yeah, uh, so at the moment we're retreating, uh, we do, we split our data into periods, which are times separated by hardware changes in the system. And that's when we're doing retraining um, is once a period. Uh, now in the future, I think one of the things we're looking at is whether we can add it to our data monitoring screen that mm -hmm. any shifter is looking at. Um, and then we would retrain more often to use it as sort of active monitoring if new anomalies are showing up. Well, uh, that sounds pretty nice. Thanks.
Okay, any other questions from anyone? Yep. Okay, thank you again so much, Julieta. This was really good. Thank um, you all. And we'll look forward to next month's talk. Um, I think it's November 20-something, but look on the on the schedule, please. Okay, thanks all. You all.